When I was a little girl, I had quite the imagination, which was fueled by reading. And the stories that I loved to read the most were those that featured beautiful princesses and damsels in distress who would be rescued by their brave knight in shining armor riding on top of the white horse, who would then take them off and give them the keys to the castle. My mother, of course, had very different ideas. It was her intention to raise both of her daughters to be strong, financially independent career women who could purchase their castles for themselves. <laughs> Nonetheless, despite all of her trying, she never was able to kill my dream. That day would come much later by motions that were put into place the day I met David Thompson at the Marine. Several days earlier, we were at work and we were talking about what we had done over the weekend. And I recounted the story about sailing on the Chesapeake Bay with a group of my friends. Barb Thompson said, ooh, you should come out with my husband. David is always looking for crew for his boat. And I, thinking I knew everything, said, sure, I'll do that. I'll go sail with David. That Sunday, I showed up at the marina, and he introduced me to the Lightning. The Lightning is a 19-foot sailboat, and it rides on a trailer. It has three sails, the main sail that swings about on the boom, the uh, jib, which is the smaller sail in the front, and also the spinnaker, which is that floaty parachute-like sail that you uh, put up when you're going downwind. For racing a lightning, there are three crew members on board. The skipper whose job is to drive the boat. The foredeck crew, their job is to control the jib and also to sit in the middle of the boat where they can keep a lookout for oncoming boats and also for changes in the wind or the water. As middle crew, my job was the most varied. When we were engaging in racing, I would first start by taking a look at how we could get the best starting position. I would time our starts and make sure, because we're constantly in motion, that we didn't start too early and have to do some penalties. Once we were underway, I would be gauging the wind, the water, and the competitors to see how we could gain our best advantage. All of this continued until we rounded our first racing buoy. At that point, we would be headed downwind and now I went into spinnaker-meister mode. My job was to sit uncomfortably on the side of the boat and crane my neck awkwardly into the sun, whereupon my sunscreen would start to run into my eyes and mix with my sweat, <laughs> causing me to be nearly blind, but from my single-minded focus on that outer edge of the sail. In this manner, I would lose all track of time and place until we reached the far end of that leg of the race, and David would shout, let's get ready to douse. Once the spinnaker was properly stowed, I would resume my activities as the onboard tactician. Now, we didn't always race the boat. There were days that we went out racing, and then there were days when we went out to practice racing. One of these days occurred on a hot and humid July afternoon. We met at the marina, Barb, David, and I readied the boat, and we put it in the water. We headed up from our marina in Alexandria all the way to Haynes Point. When we got there, Barb said, I gotta go potty. This is a problem because on board the Lightning, there are no restrooms. That meant we would now need to head all the way back home. And for us, this was going to be a very long downwind run. So we hoisted the spinnaker, and I began my activities of focusing exclusively on my sail so that we could gain maximum speed. We were continuing in this way with everyone very relaxed. David was chattering on about this and that, and Barb, with nothing much to see or do, began filing her nails. All of a sudden, just off the coast of National Airport, we were hit with a gust. This gust hit us from the side so hard that it, it swung our boom around in an accidental jive and caused us to take on water from the opposite side. We had all been on this side that was now low in the water and we made a mad scramble to get to the high side. Once we all got there, the gust came from the other side, again causing another accidental jive and sending us deep into the water taking on from that side. We were now officially in a full-on capsize. 
Somehow I ended up straddling the center of the boat. I was standing on the deck that was in the water, about knee deep in Potomac, and I was hanging on with my white knuckles to the, to the deck that was now on the high side. Looking over my shoulder, I could see Barb and David floating in the water below me. I was trying to gauge how I could climb on the centerboard trunk and get over to the top side of the boat and use my weight to try to pull the boat back into the water, knowing that I would be fighting against the soggy sails that would be trying to hold us down. Right at that moment, the first to arrive on the scene were two jet skis. They were oblivious to the wake and the effects their wake would have. All of a sudden, the boat started jostling around and I lost my grip on the top side of the deck. Now I too was in the water and the advantage that I had by still being on the boat was completely lost. Realizing they were out of their league, they took off just as quickly, leaving just as much wake in their exit. Thankfully, next on the scene was a party barge and they showed up with supplies. They happened to have a camera on board, so they were able to shoot our not so triumphant photos. <laughs> they also had a cooler of beer, which they neglected to share. But thankfully, they had some wine on board, and they threw me a length of rope that was about the size of the average shoelace and just as strong. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to do the trick to right the boat, and so the party barge quickly made their retreat as well. Now we heard some noise coming from the land over to our side, and David and I looked over and we saw a great accumulation of TSA representatives, <laughs> firemen, policemen, and all kinds of airport security personnel. And we thought, oh, well, they're going to come save us. Not so fast. Evidently, their job was to prevent us from gaining illegal access to airport property. And their shouting was to keep us away. So I decided to try to maneuver my way around to where the bottom of the boat was sticking halfway out of the water. The Lightning has a retractable centerboard, which you can use to leverage your weight against the top of the boat. And I was going to try to pull the boat down into the water and cause the sails to come up. But no sooner do I get over there than suddenly I am whisked out of the water. Unbeknownst to me, the River Fire Department had shown up on the scene. They had grabbed me by my arms and swung me across the deck of their boat like somebody's prize marlin. I was still sitting there dazed when Barb Thompson came sliding across next to me. And then I realized this was my opportunity. I was living my fairy tale. Suddenly, I was the damsel in distress, and here was a boat full of princes. Except looking around, I realized none of them were very handsome. And they were immune to my charms, as much as I was evidently immune to theirs. And their dingy red fire boat was no white steed. <laughs> then shouting ensued, and David was yelling at them. He did not want to be pulled out of the water, and he did not want the fire boat to come any closer to his boat for fear that it would damage it further. He wanted us to get back in the water and help rescue the boat. The fire department was reluctant to do so without giving us a thorough once over. They were bandaging the wound on Barb's head and asking her questions to determine if she was concussed. Once we both checked out, they allowed us to jump back in the water and they hovered while we attempted to right the boat. Eventually, we were able to get the lightning upright and we were able to get back in it and sail it home. At that point, the sun was setting over our shoulders and on that sail home, I realized that this was a different happily ever after than I had imagined. It wasn't me being the damsel in distress, and it wasn't the prince coming to rescue me. Instead, this was a combination of teamwork. And this was due to my friends and due to our training together that we were able to make our own way back home. Setting into the sunlight, I realized that for me, Happily ever after is something I can create for myself.